Madam President, uh, I want to uh, echo some of the remarks that were made by my colleague from Alabama regarding uh, a budget. He is the uh, ranking Republican, the ranking member on our side on the Senate Budget Committee. I serve as a member of that committee. And it's ironic, I think, that we are on the floor of the Senate this week, as we were last week, debating a non-binding sense of the Senate resolution that states, and I quote, those earning $1 million or more per year make a more meaningful contribution to the deficit reduction effort, end quote. Doesn't specify what that is, doesn't say if it should be tax increases or spending cuts uh, that should have an impact on these high income earners. But I would uh, echo what was uh, stated by my colleague from Alabama, and that is, this is no substitute for a budget. Congress's job is to pass a budget. That's what we're here for. That's why the people, the taxpayers of this country elect us, is to set priorities, is to come here and make decisions about where we're going to allocate their hard-earned tax dollars. Now, we haven't had a budget. Democrats have not put a budget on this floor, uh, haven't passed a budget for 805 days. 805 days. Now, this, this sense of the Senate resolution, which is vague and ambiguous and meaningless, doesn't do anything doesn't do anything to, to address the, uh, the fiscal challenges that our country faces or to achieve any level of budgetary savings. Madam so, President, will the Senator yield for a question? I'd be happy to yield. Senator Thune, you are an experienced member of the Budget Committee and a member of the leadership on the Republican side in the Senate. Um, isn't it true we had more interest in members wanting to join the Budget Committee this year, particularly the new members who had gotten elected, who had talked to their constituents about their fear of America's debt, and they wanted to be on the Budget Committee, and um, only a few could be selected out of the group that wanted to be on? And how, what's been your observation as to how they've reacted to the fact that no budget has been presented? The committee never met or even marked up and, and had hearings as the U.S. Code requires. Uh, maybe you could share with them how they felt about it. Well, and I would say, Madam President, to my colleague from Alabama, he's absolutely right. There was tremendous interest this year because, really, if you look at the, the last election, the two, 2010 election, uh, a lot of the people who were elected, new members both in the House and the Senate, were elected because they, they ran on a message to their constituents of getting America's fiscal house in order, getting spending and debt under control. Where does that start? It starts with a budget. And so they got here, and a lot of them tried to get on, on your committee, on the Senate Budget Committee. And we have all these bright new members of the United States Senate who have a lot to contribute, who have had no opportunity to do that because we haven't had a budget. We haven't had a markup. We haven't done any of the things that are necessary in order to move the budget process forward. And so uh, I am completely in, in, in agreement with the senator from Alabama when it comes to uh, what the priority should be around here. It ought to be doing a budget that actually focuses on cutting spending and getting this debt under control. I'd try to offer an amendment to this non-binding sense of the Senate resolution. Uh, unfortunately, the majority leaders blocked any amendments from being considered to this measure. But basically, it would cut all non-security discretionary spending for the current fiscal year by 2.5%. Now, a nominal amount. I recognize that, okay? It's, not a, it's not, a, not a big spending cut. It is a small haircut, and it's not going to solve our problems. It produces about $11 billion in savings from some of these accounts that have seen, as the senator from Alabama noted, extraordinary growth since 2008. Spending has increased in the discretionary part of the budget by 24% in two years, in a two-year time period when inflation in the overall economy was about 2%. So the government was spending at a rate that was 10 or 12 times the rate of inflation. Absolutely unsustainable. You can't not argue to the American people in, in, uh, with a straight face that that's, that's the kind of spending that ought to be going on here in Washington, D.C. Now, because that, uh, the amendments have been blocked, we're probably not going to get a chance to vote on that. But it's a, it is a simple, straightforward thing, just to say, let's cut by 2.5% uh, the discretionary spending, uh, given the fact that it's increased by 24% in the last two years. Now, these accounts started to feel a little bit of downward pressure when the continuing resolution passed earlier this year, but a lot more needs to be done, because we need to be putting pressure on the spending side of the equation, not the tax side. 
And all of my Republican colleagues have send it, said it multiple times, but I think it bears repeating and explaining that our problem in Washington isn't that Washington taxes too little, it is that it spends too much. And that's true. Revenues are below their historical average, but spending is dramatically higher than its historical average. And the reason we've got you know, uh, revenues that are lower than the historical average is because we've got an anemic reco recovery, economic recovery. If we get the economy growing again and expanding and creating jobs, we'll start to see some of the, the tax revenue pick up. But just as a point of fact, in 2006 and 2007, we had a very similar income tax system to what we have today. It's very similar to the current system. And at that time, it raised more revenue than our historical average. Our historical average of around 18% of our entire economy is what we raise in, in tax revenues in any typical year. That's the historical average. Well, in 2006 and 2007, where the income tax code, the rates are very similar to what we have today, we exceeded the historical average. So it isn't, the issue is not that we have too little revenue here in Washington. It's not that Washington taxes too little. It's that Washington spends too much. Once the economy starts to turn around, we know we're going we're gonna to be raising uh, a substantial and sufficient amount of revenue without having to resort to tax increases. In fact, uh, if we were to enact tax reform that was revenue neutral, and by that I mean that doesn't generate more revenue for Washington to spend, but if we were to lower the rates on people and businesses in this country and broaden the tax base, our economy would grow and expand dramatically. And we'd see, I think, even more revenue generated for the federal government and certainly more jobs created, which, was, which is what everybody in this country wants to see. We should not, however, Madam President, simply be increasing taxes to pay for an ever-increasing spending for programs that aren't sustainable. This year, federal government spending will comprise 24.3% of our nation's entire economic output. So almost a quarter of every dollar spent in this country will be spent by the federal government. Now that doesn't take into consideration spending by state and local governments, but it's 18% more than our historical average. Historically in this country, we spent about 20.6% of our entire economy on the federal government. Today, this year, 24.3%. We're almost at a quarter out of every dollar being spent uh, by, our, by our federal government here in Washington, D.C. What happens? Well, that means that there are fewer, there's less activity out there in the private economy, which is where the real jobs are created. And when the federal government is spending this much and borrowing this much, it crowds out private investment, makes it more difficult for the private economy to get out there and to create jobs that are actually uh, permanent, good-paying jobs for the people in this country. Now, perhaps an even more pertinent statistic is the years in which our budget has been balanced since 1969. These budgets were balanced because spending was constrained. If you look at the five years when the budget was balanced, the federal government spending in those years comprised just under 18.7% of our GDP, of our economic output. And so if you look at the problem that we're trying to diagnose in this country, our colleagues on the other side diagnose it as a revenue problem, but I would submit, Madam President, that the problem that we are trying to solve is a spending problem fundamentally. The five times when the budget was balanced in the last, since 1969, in every instance, in every circumstance, it was because we were spending less than the historical average. So this year's spending is over 30% more than the years in which we balance the budget. I say 30% more as a percentage of our entire economy. That's how much higher it is than the years in which we balanced our budgets. That's how much and how fast government spending is growing. Unfortunately, spending remains uh, substantially above the historical average every year in the president's budget. The president submitted a budget which borrows more, spends more, and taxes more. I can't think of a worse way to get out of an economic downturn and to start creating jobs than to continue to spend at this uncontrollable rate, to continue to borrow more and more money, and to impose higher taxes on an American economy that is already struggling. After 2018, according to the uh, President's budget, spend it, spending increases every single year. That, Madam President, is a spending problem. That's not a revenue problem. Despite that, the administration wants to take what they call a balanced approach and to have shared sacrifice. Only in Washington, D.C., 
would spending more and taxing more be considered a balanced approach? Only in Washington would shared sacrifice mean taking more of taxpayers' hard-earned money to spend on the administration's priorities. And just to put a fine point on that, this week the president said, and I quote, that he'd rather be talking about things that everyone wants like new programs, end quote. This is code for I need more of your money so that I can spend more. And Madam President, I reject that notion. We do not need more spending here in Washington, D.C. We don't need more programs. We don't need to expand government. Government is too big already at 25 percent of our entire economy. Now let's pretend for a minute that deficit reduction really was the president's priority. What's happened in the past with these, quote, balanced budget deals? Well, in 1990, the budget agreement reached by President Bush at Andrews Air Force Base was supposed to have spending cuts that outnumbered tax increases by a two-to-one margin. Spending was supposed to be cut by $274 billion, and taxes were going to be increased by $137 billion. What actually happened? Taxes certainly materialized, but the reality is that spending actually increased. And so in the 1990 balanced budget approach, we got increased spending and increased taxes. In 1982, under President Reagan, the exact same, same thing happened. And so, Madam President, I would simply say to my colleagues that this is a fundamentally a debate about the size of our government. We believe that in a debt crisis, you ought to be making government smaller, not larger, not more expansive, not creating more programs. Our colleagues on the other side have a different view. But we ought to be talking about what can we do to get people in this country back to work? What can we do to get small businesses hiring? There was a Chamber of Commerce survey that came out this week that said 64% of small businesses will not add to their payrolls this year. 12% will cut jobs. Why? Because of economic uncertainty created in Washington, D.C. Because we are unwilling to deal with the spending and debt issue that's in front of us and to be putting policies in place that will enable job creation and economic growth. The Senator's time has expired. Madam President, I hope that my colleagues will work with us to reduce the size of government, not grow it. And I yield the floor.